four or five different local uh, TV stations and about uh, four or five local radio stations. All your work was, uh, uh, was fantastic. To kind of help analyze, yeah, give yourselves a hand of applause. And uh, the awesome Loyola team. Um, <coughs> Here to help us analyze the results, uh, we put together a, a panel of some very interesting people. I'm going to go down and, uh, and uh, interview them, but not too much, uh, so, so we can incorporate some of their answers later on. They can incorporate some of their experience. Uh, over to uh, my far left is Rick Orloff, who has covered City Hall and LA politics for the Daily News for a very, very long time. I consider him to be one of the most uh, astute political reporters of local politics in California. So Rick is going and covered the race from day one. Okay, next to him is you should recognize the name because it's uh, your textbook uh, for, for those of you who are in my in my class. Okay, uh, Ray Sonenschein, uh, professor over at Cal State Fullerton, uh, was also executive director of the uh, Charter Reform uh, Commission, and of course wrote. Uh, uh, the book that you're currently reading right now in, in the LA politics course and also wrote another book about the Bradley Coalition, uh, Politics in Black and White. Okay. Uh, next to him is uh, Miguel Contreras, who is the top union leader in Los Angeles uh, County. Uh, he is, uh, started off with Cesar Chavez, rose through the ranks, and now uh, is the CEO. He's got a, this other kind of very weird title, which never makes sense, but it's basically the, the boss of the unions in Los Angeles County. I guess I shouldn't. I didn't mean boss that way. Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, uh, the, the head honcho of the unions, uh, Mr. Miguel uh, uh, Contreras. Uh, next to him is Harvey Englander, a good friend. Uh, been involved in politics a long, long time. Has run many, many campaigns, uh, uh, all kinds of campaigns at the state and local level for all kinds of different. Uh, uh, political offices. I uh, kind of got away from that a little bit more, doing more uh, public relations, governmental affairs, mostly because it probably pays a lot better and you don't have to deal with candidates. Uh, but uh, continues to dabble in that and is always uh, being uh, asked to uh, help analyze these uh, type of situations. So Harvey, I'm going to start with you and we're just going to go down the line and get us your initial reaction to the election and the results. Take about three or four minutes from that. Uh, then I'll ask you a couple of questions, then we'll open it up to the students in terms of asking questions. Harvey. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me one second. We are going to have John Shalman join us soon, and we're going to have him over there. He was the campaign manager for um, Bob Hertzberg's campaign, just in case I don't have time to introduce him when he comes in here. So he was making a lot of the political decisions as to what should be going on with that campaign. Sorry. Go ahead, Harvey. Let me start out by saying that I was greatly disappointed in the election results. And when I say I was greatly disappointed in the results, I mean the small number of people who turned out <coughs> to vote for the next mayor of Los Angeles. Uh, I don't know what it takes to, to get people motivated in this region to, to vote, but I think that that's a real problem that we have. And by the way, one of the reasons, I'm gonna blame it actually on term limits, because I believe in many cases that local elections bring out voter turnout. I just ran a campaign in Beverly Hills uh, on Tuesday called Measure A, which was a referendum campaign. We ran a very significant campaign. The no side ran a very significant campaign. Beverly Hills, which normally has a 25 percent voter turnout in their city election, had a 35 percent, uh, almost 40 percent voter turnout in this election. So I believe that, you know, in, with term limits, we had no city council races to speak of to, to, in the city to help turn voters out. So, so that's a problem. So we look at the results of the election. Basically, it's the results that everyone expected to have when this campaign began in earnest about four or five months ago, and that is that Antonio would run first, and that the mayor would run second, and that Hertzberg would run somewhere third. And in my, my view, at looking at the results that I've seen in the last you know, 36 hours, uh, the reason for these numbers are, are, are twofold, and we've talked about this, I hope it'll you know, uh, steal anybody else's th thunder. But, but number one was the voter turnout. Um, a voter turnout at 28%, if, if there had been, if it gone up to 30%, for example, that means the Valley probably would have voted a little bit heavier, maybe even 29%, only needed one more percent turnout. I think Hertzberg would have, would have had a stronger, uh, would have had a chance and would have gotten into the race, would have gotten into the runoff. 
as far as I knew, he had a very competent get out the vote operation, but he had a limited amount of money that he could spend on it at the very end because you have to be on TV. So you had the results, number one, because of turnout, number two, uh, with uh, a Republican in the race who got, who, who basically took $100,000 of his own money to get his message, particularly robocalls the last week or so, into Republican households, <laughs> having more in the race really took votes away that might have gone to Hertzberg as well. And um, that is the reason why we've got a Han Villaraigosa runoff, in my opinion. So remember there was, this is a candidate we hardly heard about, Walter Moore, but he was, did he end up finishing sixth, I'm assuming? Probably, I didn't even look uh, at that. Yeah, yeah okay. sixth. Miguel, and just to uh, remind you guys that it is being taped and there are some actual reporters out there, so just to, uh, go ahead, Miguel. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, I actually agree with Harvey that the, I think the, the uh, key story of this election was the turnout uh, on Tuesday's election. It was a very, very low turnout, uh, less than 26% of the LA's eligible voters came out and cast their ballots. I think it would have been different, if, uh, and I agree with his analysis of uh, the difference in the, in the voting. You know, uh, going in, it's been a while since uh, an incumbent mayor faced such four heavyweight opponents. If you all remember uh, eight years ago, and the last time an incumbent mayor ran for election, he had a relatively weak field. As a matter of fact, I think the, the major candidate at that time was Tom Hayden against uh, incumbent Dick Reardon. And everybody thought that Tom was not a very serious candidate, and lo and behold, it didn't really turn out that he was that serious of a candidate against an incumbent mayor. But in this case, you had four uh, high-profile uh, 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 elected officials running against this mayor, one who took the mayor into a runoff four years ago. Now, the question is asked, you know, and, and I also agree with Harvey, is that I think a lot of people could have predicted that it would have been a Villaraigosa Han runoff, even in this election, because after all, four years ago, <laughs> these two got made the runoff, and four years ago, Antonio got, you know, 46% of Los Angeles voters to vote for him. So I think he and the mayor both had an edge up on this election because they've been through it before, and people have already, I were used to voting their names. The, uh, just a quick analysis of my own opinion here is that if you look at the, the uh, four opponents that were considered major opponents, you know, Rich, clearly Richard Alicorn would like to have done better. You know, getting, garnering only 4% of the vote, uh, I think was uh, a demonstration that, that there was already a Latino powerhouse in the electoral field. You know, and even Latino, I think even his own precinct, Villaraigosa beat, beat him by two to one in his own precinct. You know, so I, I clearly, clearly the Latino vote in the Valley went for Villaraigosa, and uh, I think he's turned out to be this year's Javier Becerra, because four years ago, as Professor Gary remembers, the, uh, the, there was talk about does, does Becerra and Villaraigosa split the Latino vote, and you know, it's, uh, Antonio is showing now in two elections that he is the political Latino heavyweight in Los Angeles politics. The uh, Chief Park's uh, big problem was uh, clearly that of finances. Couldn't compete with the fundraising uh, opportunities that, that Bob Hirschberg had and the mayor and Villaraigosa. He was not in their league in terms of raising, raising uh, funds and was limited, in this case, to just uh, running a, a campaign and where he garnered his support was clearly in the black community. And, and that also, uh, uh, this where Han, I think, was hurt the most and it was in the black community. If you look at some of the exit polls, maybe some of your own polling suggests this, is that, uh, is that in the black vote, the, uh, in the black vote, uh, at least the LA Times exit polls, had Han at 20% and then they had Villarabosa at 15%. And I believe uh, Chief Parks was in the mid 50s, in the mid 50s of the of the votes of the African uh, voters who cast their ballots, which is quite significant. Because considered four years ago in the runoff, uh, uh, the mayor Han received about 80 percent of the African American vote. So that was that's a, that was a big turnaround there. But again, his campaign was limited to the uh, to the uh, 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 primarily African American voters. I think a lot of it, again was due to the lack of resources there. And it clearly, his message of law and order and being a foreign police chief did not resonate enough in the, in the uh, 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 Anglo part of the San Fernando Valley, which went to another candidate. And the other candidate, of course, is Bob Hertzberg. And I think Bob Hertzberg deserves an award from coming from the furthest behind to make this a real race. You know, I mean, uh, I know because four years ago, we backed a candidate who was 3% in the polls, and he, and he uh, made it to the runoff. So I know how difficult it is to get someone who, who's known to very little and come back in. But, you know, the story of Sacramento politicians and again, it's Bob Hirschberg, because the story of L.A. politics is littered with the bodies of Sacramento politicians who want to come back and run for L.A. offices. You know, and you, all the people in the room up here can give you a list of uh, former assemblymen and state senators 
who leave Sacramento and come to Los Angeles to, wishing to run for LA's elected offices at city council and mayor's level and lost. It happened over and over again, and, and, and Bob is now in that category, unfortunately. But he clearly, if there's an award for the best commercials or the most memorable commercials, you would have to give it to the Hertzberg campaign. There were clever commercials, and people remembered their commercials. And many people I talked to, they're the only commercial people remembered. It was the Bob Zella commercials. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, think, I think he did a good job. Again, uh, in, in terms of, of just a little bit of a critique of the campaign, I clearly think that him and Han were after the same vote in the Valley, and he didn't hit the mayor hard enough in terms of, of, a, of attack ads. And clearly, uh, with a bigger turnout that Harvard talked about or more attack ads, I think it would have been a different story with the Hertzberg campaign. Well, we'll be able to ask why there was no attack ads when we get to John. So. Sure. And, and uh, just uh, I'll wrap it up on, on Han. It's an interesting uh, story with the Mayor Han is that uh, paying, paying the, the political price for at least two big uh, uh, issues that, that you can argue he did the right thing on. One was fighting secession. You know, led the, 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 city, the campaign to keep the city together, which, which uh, again uh, 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 displeased a number of voters in the San Fernando Valley who wanted, who were pro-secession, and the termination of a popular African American police chief, Chief Parks, which angered the the uh, the, uh, the African American voters. And so he was never able to, I think, recover the voters. The question is going to be, can he recover in the uh, runoff in these two constituencies? And of course, uh, Antonio did well for himself. You know, it's uh, uh, again, it was, a, it was a coalition of the of the east side and the progressive west side. And the big question, in the runoff, is is that how he's going to do in, the, in these two constituencies I just mentioned: the uh, Valley vote and in also the African American vote. Thank you, Rafe. Uh, I'm happy to see you all because I spent Tuesday with the exit poll at the LA Times because I'm the consultant on the day of. The election, and you're the only people who will understand what it was like for me to watch the news when the absentee ballots came in, and I felt like I was like a high priest, like I had all this information that was the complete opposite of what was on the television. And it said, let's see, Han is first, uh, Hertzberg is second, and poor Antonio is a distant third. What's the explanation for his failure to succeed? And meanwhile, I'm looking at exit poll numbers that have Antonio first by a large amount. I knew you guys were doing this, and I went online to find out what you guys were up to, because uh, I had heard on the radio, I'd heard you on the radio, Amara. And so it's great to have other people doing this exit polling stuff, but it does give you this bizarre feeling of watching the news try to survive until the actual returns come in. And they don't have, wait, are there a lot of reporters here? No, just All right, well, I will say no more, but it, it's <laughs> tough. I'd rather be where we were than them sitting there just handling absentee votes. Um, I'm always surprised by everything. Um, I mean, you never get too, too old to get surprised by things. I think I was surprised by almost everything in the election. I was surprised by how well Viragosa did in the primary. I figured he would finish first. I figured he'd have about 26, 27 percent. Um, he ends up in the 30s, and not only in the 30s, but with exceptionally strong underlying numbers in terms of approval rating and other issues. He just emerges as an extremely strong candidate. I was surprised that Hertzberg didn't do better. I have some theories that we'll be talking about today. I mean, one in just shorthand would be one kitchen sink too far. Um, uh, the other one is Burton Harry Peels. You have to be very old to know what that reference is. There was a great series of commercials done when I was a little kid for beer. Everybody loved the commercials, but the beer didn't succeed. And it, got, it won all the advertising awards as the best commercials of all time, but it got beaten by Schaefer and all these other beers that just said, drink my beer. <laughs> Not funny, but people drank. They said, okay, I'll drink your beer. Okay, we'll come back to that. How did Hertzberg stall? Uh, the first question is how he rose so fast. But clearly, in the last couple of days of the campaign, he flat out stalled and then fell back a bit. It emerges in our exit polling. I'm sure some of it emerges in your exit polling as well. Um, I have theories about that. I think part of what happened was that, that Hertzberg succeeded and that his success was transferred to Viragosa uh, to a great degree, that he succeeded in building a case against the incumbent, but didn't succeed in building the case to be the alternative to the incumbent. And there was a more experienced, better known alternative out there. So in the end, I believe he earned votes for Antonio Viragosa more than for himself. Um, the mystery, the other mystery is Jim Hahn. 
uh, looking at the internal results in the Times exit poll, uh, this is a guy who has been grievously wounded politically. I don't mean seriously wounded, I mean grievously wounded. Uh, if you look at approval ratings in various groups around the city, it's simply the kind of statistics that no one ever wants to see. It's, it's the bad news from the doctor uh, to getting the numbers all up and down the board in all kinds of areas. And he's in the runoff, which is kind of interesting because the sub-mystery is how someone with numbers as bad as that made it into the runoff. And I looked at our exit poll, the Times exit poll, and he has something I've never seen before. It's undifferentiated support. It's about 25% in virtually every group except Asian Americans who stand out. Listen to this. 24% of Democrats, 23% of Independents, 25% of Republicans. In other words, this is a guy who has lost the pillars of his coalition and like a over 40 pitcher who doesn't have the fastball and doesn't have the curve, but it's the ninth inning and they're still in the game and it's a tie score. They haven't been defeated because they're throwing stuff in there and still getting some people out. This is a very formidable politician is the conclusion I draw from that. Because with these numbers, there is no way your average politician makes it to number two in this race. Which is why um, all logic tells me he has not the remotest chance of winning the election. And if you ask me to bet my mortgage on the runoff election, I will not bet a penny. Because if he's able to recapture any of the pieces of his coalition, any part of it, he becomes much more competitive. What he's got now is the incumbency and the experience, and that gets them a solid quarter of the vote kind of everywhere. This is people you talk to, they say, well, I don't know, I'll vote for Han, he's the mayor. That's 25% right there. Not a bad thing to have. Would I rather be in his shoes right now where Villaraigosa's? You've got to be kidding. Because I think that, that Villaraigosa is far stronger than he was four years ago, and Han is far weaker. Um, but you'd be amazed how quickly things change in politics. You'd be amazed what would happen if in two weeks the U.S. attorney and the district attorney announced that they're closing all the investigations and that everything, there was nothing to indict anybody on. These things happen. The reverse could happen. Nothing could happen from that. Um, all kinds of things can be out there. Charges will be made. And I will say one thing about Viragosa. He managed to get through the primary unscathed because nobody was scathing him. And remember, uh, your numbers always look good when everyone else is attacking everybody else and you haven't been the target of the attack. I don't expect his favorability ratings to be as high. I expect the race to get closer. But I will tell you, I'm shocked by everything. I'm shocked by Walter Moore. I'm shocked by just Walter Moore. I mean, no matter what he did, I'm shocked by Walter Moore. <laughs> I'm, I'm shocked that Alarcon, oh, and partly because the, the more people keep sending nasty emails to anybody who reports he's not getting a huge share of the vote. They're very angry and weird people. Alarcon did even worse than... Careful, he lives in Westchester. He might be around. I know. Walter, I, I, I'm just kidding. This is all just in fun. Just goofing around here. Um, Parks did probably better than I would have originally suspected for a campaign that it's hard to argue what the basis of the campaign was other than something you need really a novelist rather than a scholar to look at, which is just Revenge is a dish best served cold, as, as Shakespeare said. I mean, that's really, it's a revenge campaign. Usually they don't do very well. I think it did rather well for a, a campaign of resentment. Um, and then he'll get to pick, uh, I, I think he won't endorse Han in the runoff. <laughs> <laughs> See, that will be the one thing I can I'll say. I'll bet my mortgage on that. Yes, and I can honestly say that will be one thing about which I will not be surprised. Okay. Rick. Uh, First off, thank you for having me here. This is, I think this is the earliest postmortem of an election I've ever been at and where the bodies are still kind of twitching and having <laughs> thrown their dirt on top of them. Um, I'm a little bit surprised by the results, uh, but also not. Uh, Jim Hahn, uh, I wrote this four years ago, that uh, do you believe in Jim Hahn now? That people have had the tendency throughout his career to underestimate him and his ability to get elected. He's been elected six straight times to citywide offices. And he's a formidable, hard, tough campaigner. And even though you hear these jokes about Mayor Yawn and he has no personality unless he's had a couple of drinks, that, <laughs> that this is a man who knows how to win elections. Um, I think it also shows um, what a, 
a friend that John and I have in common has this 3M theory of politics. You need money, message, and a machine. Uh, Han was able to get out early a year before the other candidates and raise most of the money he needed for this race to stay within the spending limits. He had a message of he dropped crime in the city, <coughs> affordable housing, empowered neighborhood councils, and a variety of other things. And he had Miguel Contreras. He was able to block Antonio Villaraigosa from winning the union endorsement this year. And this last Saturday, I was at uh, two events, one a Han rally at his campaign headquarters. There were 300 union members there and all chanting four more years, four more years. The next day at Cantor's Delicatessen, Hertzberg, where he gave him the kitchen sink, uh, get, we tried to give Han the kitchen sink, um, the Hertzberg people had 10 or 15 people there and the Han people had 50 or 60 people there. And so the organization that the mayor was able to put together and use effectively, um, I think was one of the final deciding factors is. Another factor is, in my mind, is the mayor decided he wanted to run against Antonio again. He had beat him once before. He thinks he's got his number. He thinks that once it guns came down to a two-person race, that people would choose him over Antonio. And that's for a variety of reasons that we can go into a race am among them, to be honest with you. And I think the third factor is he decided that Hertzberg, who, who John did a wonderful job of bringing Hertzberg from z zero name ID to, to where he got, where he almost made the runoff. And everything I heard is that Hertzberg was surging up until the last 10 days when Hans started his attacks on Enron and the Sacramento politicians. And I heard, and John may say this or may not, that the campaign just stalled at that point and wasn't able to get the, pick up any more momentum to try and gain on what he had been doing. And um, then the, the other remaining question that in the primary that everyone was waiting for is, is what Rafe was referring to. Well, it's, it, at City Hall, we were calling it the what if factor. What if the indictments come down? What does that, or, or if they don't, what does that do to the race? And at this point, we have now have seven weeks, and the, a U.S. attorney told me, and it's kind of a funny deal, in, in the federal system, they have attorneys for days of the week. And the first indictment on the uh, public relations executive came out on a Thursday. So that means we have a Thursday grand jury looking at the Han administration. So every, any given Thursday afternoon or Friday morning, that's when you should look at your papers or watch the news to see if there's been an indictment. Because that, that's what we're doing at City Hall. Uh, today, I left at 4 o'clock, and we were, we were clear for today. <laughs> John. Oh, so close. Ah, so it's close. not over. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't think they told. I don't think Bob told you he conceded yesterday. That's right. I was there. It was, it was uh, twenty-four thousand outstanding votes. Well, what? Well, tell us a little bit about the what assessment. The but what would you do differently if you could? Not much. Not much. Um, you know, feel, this feels like an autopsy, and the body's still alive. It's just listening to everybody here. Um, you know. First of all, let me ask you this. Why did you take this? Because Hertzberg was nowhere when, yeah. when he comes to you and you say he's, you're 2% in the polls when he comes to you. And, and you needed the job or what? I, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a softie for the long shot. You know that, Fernando. I, I, you know, I did Loretta Sanchez against Bob Dornan many years ago, and, and that was a similar situation where people thought no chance in the world. And uh, I guess, you know, given my favorite movies are Hoosiers and Seabiscuit, <coughs> You kind of know where I tend to go. Um, I, I, you know, basically I feel so, you know, many of my clients, I have several clients on the city council, Wendy Gruel, who ran a very uh, long shot campaign against Tony Cardenas in the Valley, um, Martin Ludlow, Tom LaBonge, and I, I feel just an absolute sense that Los Angeles is stalled and that we needed someone with incredible passion and some big ideas. Uh, you know, Rafe and I worked a, a, a while back on Burroughs, which was this idea that, that Wendy Gruel and Bob Hertzberg had in the midst of secession, where you had one group of people who wanted to break up the city and another group wanted to keep it together. Well, Wendy and Bob sort of got together and said, look, we can maybe keep it together but devolve power in a way that makes some sense for a city that is like Los Angeles, which isn't like a traditional urban city of New York or Chicago. Uh, and and it, it really sort of resonated with me as, as good public policy and, and, and bringing a new level of conversation to the future and governance of Los Angeles. So that's what hooked me on with Bob. And, and I sort of felt like 
it, it, it never matters to me the electoral opportunity. What matters to me is fire in the be belly and, and a sense of, you know, spirit and independent spirit who's, who's willing to breathe new life into a city that desperately needed it. And so I saw Bob Hertzberg who had a volcano in the belly. I mean, it was beyond uh, anything you could possibly imagine. And, and so he and I sat together and it was uh, right after my, my birthday in February of last year and we talked about this campaign, we talked about what it would look like. And remember this, and I think this was the critical difference in the campaign, that back in February or so of 04, uh, John Kerry had just sort of swept through Iowa and New Hampshire and it was pretty clear he was the nominee and his, he had tremendous momentum. And who was one of the chair people of that campaign? None other than Antonio Villarosa, <coughs> someone who had also said he wasn't going to run for mayor of Los Angeles. And so in our political calculus, we looked at this race being Jim Hahn, Bernard Parks, Richard Alicon, and Bob Hertzberg. And so our sense was, this is a tremendous opportunity, uh, notwithstanding the fact you're going to do it anyway. It just didn't matter. This guy was going to run because he just felt like we needed to. But from a political consultant standpoint, you're looking for a pathway. You're looking for how do I cobble together the numbers to get me to 30% or 25%. Well, under those circumstances, it was pretty clear that not only could Bob get into the runoff, but I felt pretty confident he could actually finish first in the runoff. Um, and so he got into the race, and it was tremendous enthusiasm, uh, a lot of coverage from the Times. We launched a website called changela.com, which we thought was an opportunity to have a conversation with voters uh, using the internet. And changela.com was not bobhertzberg.com. So understand, this is a guy who was prepared to say, look, this isn't really about me. This is about you. And uh, I'm jumping off the cliff, and I'm just going to hope that people are going to catch me. Because if we do this thing right, people will be so motivated with this idea that they're going to be empowered in a city that has been so disconnected from its people, in, in, in a government that's been disconnected from the citizens that they serve. So ChangeLA.com came in, and it was exciting, and we got a lot of good press. And Bob raised more money in the first uh, 40 days that, uh, ever that any candidate has ever done. We got to $200,000 quickly. We hit, we outraised the mayor in the first cycle report. There was a lot of enthusiasm. Then something happened. Antonio Villaraigosa got in the race. And right after the Democratic Convention in August when um, maybe things weren't looking quite as good for, for John Kerry, uh, Antonio got in. And instantly, now understand, Antonio was not the Antonio of 01 when he got in the race. This was an extremely popular political figure who, as you saw in the results of this election, had support across the spe spectrum. It wasn't just with Latinos. He was, he was very, very popular among West Side voters, among Jewish voters, among a base that really we saw as being, being ours. And uh, so we had to instantly recalculate how we're going to put this thing together. Uh, and agility is important. When you're running a campaign, if you can't move, <coughs> you are going to be stuck. So our sense was we had to go directly into uh, a, a, a smaller base. And therefore, when you go into a smaller base of people that you can target, you have to have a higher margin to carry you. So we had to really hone in on Valley voters, Republican voters, moderate Democratic voters. And so our, our decisions at that point were totally calculated on this fact that we're going against two perfectly well-known people who had spent $15 million just three years prior get it building themselves up, who um, really were, were going to be incredibly difficult to get past one or the other. So not only did we have to get past Alicon and Parks, we now had to get past someone else to get into the runoff. And from, when you're going from zero, it's a very difficult thing to continue to leapfrog over people. So, so our, we, we did that. And we also felt that um, it was important to come out on a couple of key issues in a very strong, provocative way. And if you recall, any of you who watched the opening debate when the five candidates stood together, everyone talked about a city that was in turmoil and a city that needed change and corruption and all these issues. Bob Hertzberg didn't talk about corruption. He turned to voters and said, I'm going to skip the platitudes, cut to the chase. I'm going to break up the Los Angeles Unified School District. 
because 53% of our kids who enter the ninth grade fail to graduate, and that's unacceptable. <coughs> and I can't lead a great world city if I don't have a world-class education system. And if you look at the city of Los Angeles that leads the nation in adult illiteracy, that has more gang members than any other city, that has the highest gang violence rate, you say, is it a coincidence? I don't think so. If I'm going to deal with crime, if I'm going to bring businesses to the city, if I'm going to ensure that the future is, is one that uh, our kids can, uh, can succeed in, I've got to fix our schools. And I reject the notion that a mayor has nothing to do with schools. And I'm ready to have that debate. Now, understand, he truly believed it. I mean, it was consistent with his concepts of boroughs and devolution. But some people, uh, you know, attacked him for it. They said it's a gimmick. Everyone goes back to break up. Um, and he stayed with it. He stayed true to it. He stayed with it. And from that, we started focusing on big issues and issues that we felt that the mayor had not been successful on. Uh, we did not attack this mayor in, in any great way on corruption. When we were asked the question, when Bob was asked the question, he would say, of course, we, we, we've got a problem in City Hall. Taking your fundraiser and putting him in charge of the, the Department of Water and Power and airports and harbor is a problem. But Fixing corruption doesn't relate to the average person. The average person wants to know, how are you going to make my life better? And when you say, I'm going to take money out of City Hall, it doesn't <coughs> quite do it. But when you say, I'm going to ban road construction during rush hour, that does it. People say, yeah, that's crazy. Why are we doing that? If you say you're going to reform our schools so kids are actually coming out into school and then out with a diploma, that affects people. So Bob got right into the issues that affect the quality of people's lives, not least of which was putting police officers on the street. Um, and critically to that was to not raise taxes to get there, which obviously people say, well, that appeals to Republicans. Let me tell you, Democrats don't like high taxes either. And so uh, we felt that those were three messages that needed to get through. And uh, our money was not going to be quite as solid as we thought it would be when before Antonio got in the race. And so we had to push the envelope from an advertising standpoint <coughs> so that people would remember what we did. So we made a few calculations, one of which was to go on TV early, uh, knowing that when you rob yourself of television er uh, uh, at the end <coughs> to pay for TV early, you won't have the resources necessarily you might want at the end of the campaign. On the other hand, if you don't do well with absentees, you're out before the game even begins anyway. So it was a political risk. We took it. We think it was it, it, it worked, um, just not quite to the extent that we would have liked it to. So um, I'm not sure uh, if, if I would have changed anything. I think the political circumstances, the changing, you know, we thought the planets were aligned, and then they moved out of alignment. And we just had to, had to adjust for that. So. A damn tsunami. Yeah, yeah. I, and also understand that when if you can't get attention from voters through free media when you're underfunded and you're in an insurgent campaign, um, it becomes that much more difficult. So we had a November presidential election, probably the, the most closely <coughs> watched, hotly contested presidential. We had uh, moved, rolled right into holidays, which is, you know, the last thing people want to talk about or hear about is another election. We then moved into a, a very compressed political cycle. It used to be that the election was in mid-April. They moved it back to the first week of March, which made it even more difficult for us. Uh, and then there were rains and, you know, Michael Jackson trial and all sorts of things. So <laughs> everything to take, take uh, uh, you know, attention away from us trying to, you know, be larger than life, literally, to get people's attention. Yeah. John, we've heard a couple of the panelists here, but also others have told me, you know, the campaign stalled the last couple of days. Yeah. Uh, you lacked agility at the end. Is that because of a tax, because of lack of money, because you went on TV early? What, what could you have done the last couple of days? I, well, or do you agree with the idea that you stalled? No, I, I, look, uh, uh, the campaign didn't stall under its own uh, um, influences. Uh, we, we got into a situation where we, our trajectory was exactly where we had hoped it to be. We were making a move. And when you make a move, you you can either become a freight train uh, or you can kind of, you know, uh, uh, get stalled through some outside forces. And so Jim Hahn saw that we were moving and we were moving quickly. And so he went for the attack. Um, when he went for the attack, it was my anticipation, frankly, and uh, uh, others in our campaign will, will attest to this. I predicted he would do the two peas in a pod. 
because, you know, Bill Carrick, who I admire a lot, uh, had just got out of uh, Iowa doing Gephardt's campaign in a multi-candidate field when Gephardt and Dean were attacking each other, and other candidates benefited. So you had John Kerry and you had John Edwards who kind of rose through the middle in those attacks. So I, I, I believe he learned something from that and decided, look, I'm going to wrap them together. There's plenty of commonality. They were in Sacramento. They were speakers um, and other things that he used in that, that wonderful ad. Um, and, and he threw them together because the race was a three-way dead heat. And he figured one of them would potentially come down to him, reel, reel them back in. Uh, uh, and, and so in anticipation of that, our sense was Antonio would not stand and take it. There's no way. This is a guy who four years ago was criticized for not responding and that they had something in their can ready to rock and roll to go back at him. So it was our view that if Antonio is going to do the hit, what our response should be was something, the crushing television was what we believed was what every voter would want to do. You're seeing negative attack ads on television. Wouldn't you want to see someone just step on that television and start talking about issues we care about again? So our hope was that Antonio would shoulder the burden of the negative attacks and that we would be able to kind of rise above it talking about the key issues that people cared about. Well, what happened was uh, Antonio did exactly what we expected. He came up with a negative attack. But he also understood. Uh, and he was in a better position both financially and, and in terms of the vote, that he didn't want to be caught in this letting Hertzberg come up above the fray. He pulled his ad down, and he had enough of space that uh, really we were, we were the ones that were going to be tied in in that fight, that back and forth. The other thing that no one here knows, because you don't live in the valley and, well, maybe you do. Uh, Who lives in the valley? If you, any of one live in the valley who's a Republican? Okay, no one. We don't allow them into LMU. <laughs> so if you were... Well, at least in political science. Yeah. They're, this all is, in, they're all over in engineering. If, if you were a... Yeah, that's right. If you were a Republican and you lived in the Valley, uh, you received dozens of recorded phone messages. You received dozens of political mail pieces paid for by independent expenditures that attacked Bob Hertzberg as being a you know, Democrat who bankrupted the state, who taxes everybody. Every opposite message you'd want to see communicated to Republicans if you're a Democrat trying to get Republican votes. And uh, that is, in fact, in my personal belief, what, what stalled Bob Hertzberg. It's they went right into his base with very targeted messaging that drew enough people off of him onto Walter Moore, onto Bernard Parks, I mean, if you look at the performance of Walter Moore and Bernard Parks in some of the key areas of the Valley, where we, as I told you earlier, we had to get a margin to overcome our deficiencies in other parts of the city. We didn't have the resources to run in. Um, that's, that's what tipped the scale. I mean, that one and a half points came out of, in my view, those that almost $1 million of targeted negative phones and mail. Um, one more question for you. This kitchen sink. Yes. Well, was that your idea, or whose idea was that? Uh, it was, you know, well, explain to the students if they don't know about the uh, kitchen sink. Uh, we, knew the, we knew the attacks were coming. You know it. When you're moving, there's only one thing the other side can do. They can sit there and watch you go by and wave to you. Or they can, uh, in Jim Hahn's uh, um, uh, consultants, they can take your legs out so you can't run. And so we knew it was coming. We wanted to make sure the press knew we knew it was coming and that they wouldn't get a free shake at it. So um, when it did come, it came hard. And it came in every, you know, I mean, Jim, I, I think he took control of, I, one of these things is, uh, I think the press took the bait. Um, the Enron story, this issue that Bob had taken money from Enron and somehow created the energy crisis. Uh, was 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 crazy. He was one of 120 legislature, le legislators, and, and obviously we know we recall the governor for, for that very reason. So it was sort of a simplistic way to attach him to something everyone sort of perceives as being negative. Well, the press kept going with it. I mean, there were stories three days in a row, and rather than talking about the message that we were hoping people would talk about, which is breakup and traffic and cops without taxes, uh, it was all about Enron, it was all about Bob Hertzberg, 
combined with the negative ads, it was a tough thing. So we felt we need something symbolic to, to deliver to Mayor Han, since he had thrown everything else at us. We would give him the kitchen sink to just save him the trouble. And um, we had a little bit of an accidental run-in with him, which was interesting, at Canners where uh, Rick was at. So that really was accidental? You know, our, we, we brought the kitchen sink because we knew he was going to be there. But we only knew he was going to be there because our, it never happens. It's very rare. But we looked at the public schedules of the mayor before we went out. And we thought we saw that he was going to be at Cantor's the exact same time we had planned to be on Cantor's without knowing he was going to be there. So we thought, what a great venue to offer him the kitchen sink. And uh, as Rick will tell you, he didn't take it and kind of ran through canners uh, faster than you saw him running in his TV ad. <laughs> uh, Harvey. The, the funniest thing at that yeah, canners ahead, event was uh, the mayor had his sister with him. And Hertzberg has a nickname of Huggy Bear or Hertz, Hug, Hugs Bear because he likes to hug everyone. So Janice, the mayor's sister, is standing in one of the aisleways as, as Hertzberg's trying to follow the mayor around. And she holds her arms out like this for a hug. And Bob, being Bob, <laughs> grabs her and hugs her, and she, she wouldn't let him go. <laughs> and I see her whispering in his ear, and I said, what were you saying? She says, I'm holding on to you until my brother gets out of here. <laughs> and she's strong, yeah. because he's strong. <laughs> <laughs> stronger than, stronger than Jim. <laughs> Harvey, uh, we've heard a lot that this, the runoff's going to be negative. Okay, if you're running, and you've run many campaigns, some of them would be defined as negative. Uh, Imperative. Yeah. Uh, what would you do if uh, you're uh, Jim Hahn's uh, campaign team, and what would you do if you're Antonio's campaign team? Well, I think, I think Jim is going to do what he did four years ago. He's going to start negative, remain negative. Um, he, he's got to continue to remind people, how, <coughs> Republicans, how liberal Antonio is. Um, he's got to go into the African-American community and say, do you really want a Latino? I mean, you know, you sort of know me, and I'm the last mayor and all that. Do you really want a Latino? He's going to ex try and exploit the black-brown conflict that, that many people feel is inherent. Um, he's obviously going to, to, to work, I think, hard here in, in, in Westchester. Remember, you know, Westchester has been good to him in the past. He's a former resident of Westchester. This council district is going to have a higher turnout than the rest of the city because there is a runoff election for city council here. So he's going to motivate, try and motivate in Westchester, the, the homeowners, the Republicans. He's going to certainly work hard in San Pedro. Um, and he's got to find a way, interestingly enough, to figure out how to get the Valley, particularly the West Valley, to vote. I think that is his biggest problem, is motivating the West Valley. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see what he comes up with. And I'm not sure that scaring people about Antonio and drugs and, and letters and things like that is going to do it. So that's what, that's what, what Han has to do. What, what does Antonio do? Um, I think Antonio is going to keep reminding people about um, the deficiencies in Jim Hahn, whether it's his administration, whether it's the potholes, um, that he's a do-nothing mayor. Um, he may start calling him you know, some other name because everybody jokes that really Bill Bratton's the mayor. Uh, we read a political roast uh, last week that, that, that I'm a co-chair of for the American Diabetes Association and everybody joked because we had a life-size, full-size cutout of Bill Bratton that it was really that Bill Bratton, Bratton was the mayor and everybody was picking up the, the cutout and, and speaking, he was speaking as mayor. So an Antonio has got to, got to really denigrate Jim in terms of what has he done. I think he's going to, I, I, I think John's right, I think the corruption issue is an insider issue until such time as there's a meaningful indictment. Um, so I don't. You know, both our exit poll and the LA Times poll were pretty strong on that. That they they feel. I mean, his intent. I mean, four years ago, <coughs> he was starting off as city attorney, known as a, one of the most honest guys in LA politics ever. To today, according to the poll, people don't seem as honest. Well, what, what's going to happen? It's going to be honest in comparison to a guy who has raised. Six million dollars, eight million dollars, ten million dollars in his career from the Enrons and the special interests. And you know, you heard about Enron in the primary. You will hear about everyone else in the runoff that Antonio has ever raised money from in terms of the special interests. But but Antonio has got to has got to you know he's going to talk about integrity. But there are other issues he's going to talk about as well. Antonio has got to talk about what he's got to pick up a lot of the the 
pizzazz, the, some of the, the themes other than the education themes that Hertzberg had. He's going to talk about what he's going to do for the city, what he's going to do for you. He's going to talk about making L.A. great. Not great again, but making L.A. great. You know, when you, when you look at other major cities, you look at New York, for example, and you can go back to the, the 20s and 30s with, with Robert Walker and then Robert Wagner and Fiorella LaGuardia and... You know, you've, you've had these great mayors over the years that, that were, were household names. Um, Chicago with, with Daly, uh, father and son. San Francisco with Willie Brown and, and Joe Aliotto and George Moscone and these, these, these dynamic names. And I think Antonio, a big part of his campaign is going to be L.A. deserves a dynamic, we're a dynamic city, we deserve a dynamic mayor. So that's where he's going to move because Jim's electorate, and remember, if we had, what, a 28% voter turnout in the primary, what's our runoff turnout going to be? 20%? 22%? I mean, we're really talking the best and the brightest are going to turn out. So he's got to really energize people. So low turnout out. helps Han or Villaraigosa? <coughs> Always says it depends who turns out. <laughs> okay, Miguel. Devil's advocate here. You're the head of the unions. You endorsed Antonio four years ago. Okay. You don't endorse him this year, but your membership voted for him. Okay. Uh, the guy barely wins. Um, you know, unions today told you, you, your members told you, we want Villaraigosa. Are you guys, is the leadership, union leadership, as detached from its membership as most elected officials are from the people? What's, what's going on here? Now, that was a uh, uh, devil's oh. advocate. I really don't believe, I'm not, I would never talk to him this, uh, <laughs> go ahead. You know, I just think that we're, uh, in, in some ways, we're a victim of our own success. Uh, this clearly, if you pick the last four years, our, our unions have spent, for Antonio Villaragosa, in the last mayor's race, we went $2.2 .2 million uh, for Antonio Villaragosa. Much of that money aimed at union members in Los Angeles, convincing them to vote for Antonio Villaragosa. And, and uh, 18 months later, and has run for city council in the areas of Eagle Rock and Highland Park and Nikon uh, Heights and those areas. We went another $400,000 convincing our union members there to vote for Antonio Villaragosa. So, you know, we're into Antonio Villaragosa in the last four years alone of over, over $2.5 million. So why, why not continue so the it's investment? A, it's the, uh, it's the, uh, because we had a mayor who's been good for us. Mm -hmm. He's been good to working families. He's been good for our trade union movement. And, you know, I told everybody that I thought one day Antonio would be a great mayor, and I still believe he'll be a great mayor, you know, but we think that uh, uh, we have a good working relationship with uh, Mayor Hahn, and that he deserves re-election. But again, we understand oh, that, you know, how we, the fact that we spent over two and a half million dollars in the last four years alone on Antonio Villaraigosa, he ain't going to turn that around in a few short weeks. Yeah. Hey, Harvey, how can oh, you... Oh, this one was a sure. I to tell you that. Also, another thing that comes to play in that one is the fact, and we saw it four years ago, that the highest union density in Los Angeles among union members is in the 8th, 9th, and 10th districts. And these fellows up here know that that's primarily South Central Los Angeles. You know? And we saw it even, last, even four years ago when we went off of Villaraigosa and we got a split union, member, uh, union vote because the 8th, 9th, and 10th district were a loyal black vote for Han. And in this case, they were not there for the mayor. So that is a disturbing area for us because it's hard. We, gotta figure out, we haven't figured that out yet, the whole <laughs> African-American vote, union vote in the 8th, 9th, and 10th district. Um, Harvey, how, do, how does Han paint uh, Villaraigosa as a liberal when the unions usually associated with liberal policies are going to be with Han? Oh, that's easy. It doesn't matter who's with you. It doesn't matter who supports you. You so do what you have matter. to do. <laughs> I mean, and, and to be honest with you, though, we had, and, 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 and I mean, Rick's been there forever, but I look at the, look at the bylines of... You meant that in a positive way, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, Rick and I essentially grew up together in, in, in this business. He's been covering... I've been in this business 36 years. And Rick, Rick, Rick's covered my first campaign, you know, when, when, when the direct mail was carved on a stone. Uh, but Rick was carving a, a tablet for the Daily News. Um, you know, you had... While the LA Times did better in covering this race that I've ever seen them cover a mayor's race. You had a bunch of neophyte reporters who don't ask the tough questions. There are very few Rick Orlovs who know, who know the questions, who know how government works, who can ask the tough questions. And so the people who will ask that question will never ask that question. Rafe, coalitions, the Bradley Coalition, 
the Han Coalition was a weird coalition. African Americans and white valley people. It's an unsustainable coalition. Is that what we're seeing here? That just coalition was not sustainable over one election, and it's just going to be a tough time putting it together? Well, what kind of coalition does Han put together to win? What kind of coalition does Antonio put together to make sure he wins? Han's coalition was weird, but we've seen it once before, which was when uh, Sam Yorty was elected in 1961. We had inner city minority groups in the San Fernando Valley. That was not sustainable. But the reason that was not sustainable is because race emerged as the central issue in the city, and you really have to choose. He chose the conservatives over African Americans. Han actually had a coalition that could have reelected him, I think, uh, even though in the terms that I use coalition, I wouldn't really call it a coalition. It's not that African Americans and whites in the Northwest Valley got together and talked about issues of common concern, uh, which was the old black Jewish coalition. But they could have probably stayed in the same camp somehow had the parks firing not emerged and had secession not been put on the ballot in November 2002. Without those two things, this is kind of a fairly boring re-election of the mayor, I think. Nobody too excited about it, but we just walked through it. And maybe over time, what develops is a coalition of the groups that feel somewhat imperiled by the changes in the city. And one thing we haven't talked about much is, is immigration, as, which I keep thinking is the sort of, if there's like, we're talking about the, the notes on the page, but there's this background music all the time in LA now, which is immigration, how it's changing the city, and putting people into different positions like African Americans now being at least 50% of the time kind of in a reactionary stance against change, and the other half being kind of progressive and getting caught in the middle, the same with parts of the valley. I think what's happened is that the personal political issues that Tom had got in the way of the beginning of the development of maybe a set of competing coalitions of Latinos and liberal whites on the one hand, and maybe African Americans and to some degree conservative whites on the other. What Han has to do is somehow get back to where he was four years ago, which I just don't know if he can manage it, but Viragosa is where he needs to be because he has now the repeat of the coalition he had before, but considerably stronger. <clears throat> I will say, though, and, and listening to John's really superb analysis of the campaign, I think, somebody once said, politics ain't beanbag. Uh, and we all, that's a really old-fashioned funny. It's like, it's not a game. It's serious, and people take your head off all the time. And out here, there's often, we still find ourselves surprised by rough tactics and politics, and doing post-mortems and saying, boy, you know, they really, they were really tough. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you usually find tread marks on the back of your head at the end of a political campaign. And what you think about is how to put some tread marks on the other guy's head, either before or after that happened. I mean, it should never even be a matter of debate. I mean, I'm from New Jersey. And in New Jersey, we hit you when we're getting along. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> like not even an issue. But, but there does seem to be more of a sense of deep ambivalence about what we call negativity that um, simply is the rule is, if you talk about kitchen sink, actually kitchen sink is right. What you throw at your opponent is every single thing you have. And then the other side throws every single thing they have. And Antonio will be hit with being a liberal. He'll be, I mean, it's not that he's a conservative. I mean, it's not a not a fraud necessarily, but you'll dis his record will be distorted and they'll distort Han's record in return and people will choose. Okay, one more question. I'll turn it over to the students here. On, on, in our poll, now, the LA Times didn't ask this question and we don't understand why, but our poll asked, if no candidate wins 51% today and there's a runoff election, who would you vote for? Okay, and Antonio comes out, you know, uh, 57 to 30. And amongst all groups, he ends up winning, with the exception of Asians. But blacks, 49% are willing to vote for him, only 33 for Han, and still 17 willing to not have made up their mind yet. And that's a surprising number to some extent. But how sustainable, I know it's an election or the, a survey coming right out, and we still have 10 weeks of the election. How sustainable is that? I mean, well, can you well, tell me that number again? It's, what, it's, it's right there. That, that yeah. piece right there. It, it depends. For example, we saw Supervisor Yvonne Burke endorse Bernard Parks in the primary, but I should go back to Jim Hahn. Maxine Waters was strangely quiet during the primary. Does she go back to Jim Hahn? 
So we don't know where a lot of these people, where a lot of these critical endorsements are going to end up. We don't know. We can all assume where Bernard Parks will go. He will go anyone but Jim Hahn. But let me tell you something. I, I lobbied the Los Angeles City Council. I'm down there. The, the, Bernard Parks and, and Antonio don't vote alike on many issues because Antonio's a lot more liberal than Bernard is. Uh, so, you know, but Bernard's going to endorse. Well, we, we, we have to assume that. We don't know where Bob Hertzberg's going to go, if he's going to go anywhere in this race. So we don't know what he's going to do. We, you know, we, we don't know what Richard Alarcon's going to do. Well, I would say this. It's 80% sure that Parks is going to endorse Villaraigosa. I would be about 65% sure that Alarcon's going to endorse Villaraigosa, and about 50% sure that Hertzberg's going to endorse Villaraigosa, but not, I don't think none of those three endorse the mayor. John? What, what, one point about that, sure. though. Is, I mean, there, there's endorsements, and then there's endorsements. Right. If, if, I mean, if they just say, yeah, I'm, I'm endorsing the mayor, yeah, I'm endorsing Villaraigosa, that's fine. If, but it's a question if they really work to try and get their voters uh, to believe them, that they really do want that person to win the office, that then the endorsement means something. It, 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 if they just say, I'm all right, um, just to get your reporters <coughs> off my back and I don't want to hear any more about this, I'm endorsing Han, I'm endorsing Viragosa, then it doesn't have as much impact. Let Question. me also give a great example, just briefly, about in terms of campaigns, okay? And we've got here Miguel Contreras, absolutely the most important labor figure, one of the most important political figures in the city of Los Angeles. This is the way political campaigns work, and, and I'm not working for any of the candidates for mayor, but this, this is being taped, and he has said that Antonio Villaraigosa will make a great mayor of Los Angeles. He has said that before. We don't know if some independent expenditure committee will take that statement, take it off TV, off channel, off the city channel when it runs, will take it from a news story, and run a major part of that campaign. And if you've really got a lot of money, target it right to union members. Okay, that's the way political campaigns are run. And they're, that's when they're done with a scalpel. And both of the people running the campaigns, and, and John Shulman, who, who my hat is off to, who ran a brilliant campaign, um, you know, that's what's going to happen this election. You're going to see these changes. So, so you're going to see non-endorsement endorsements, and you're going to see endorsements that are non-endorsements. Dr. Marks has got the microphone. Anybody, any questions out there from any students? Yeah, Michaela. Hello. Um, I was wondering, you guys are talking about Han is going to run a negative campaign, and I'm wondering, is he going to run a negative campaign? I mean, he already has, but is he going to do that because he has nothing to run on? I mean, my perspective is, you know, he's had four years to prove himself, so, you know, obviously there's a reason why he's in the position that he's in, you know, behind Villaraigosa. But, um, so I just want to know, basically, why do you guys feel like his rationale for running a negative campaign? Because they're effective. Let's well, go first with of all, Mike, Miguel, and then... I guess I, I, maybe I disagree with some of the other panelists on the premise that he's going to run a negative campaign or that his campaign will be entirely negative. I think his campaign will strongly defend his record on issues like public safety um, and a number of other issues. I don't think he's going to run a 100% negative campaign. I think he's going to argue that uh, I haven't given forth really a clear statement of what I've done. I really want to get some credit for my record. It is weird. People love Bratton, but don't connect that Han brought Bratton in. They give Han no credit for Bratton. Now, you could argue that part of his campaign will be to say, not just to show Bratton's picture, but say, folks, I just have to show you he's here because I brought him here. I went to New York and found him. Let me show you. Here's New York. I mean, sort of like, bring it here. That's positive. That's not negative. Uh, and again, I, I believe that negative, the voters always make a distinction in negative between negative and comparative. Um, you are in a, in a two-person race, and your job is to say, I should be mayor and not this other person. You know, now that could be done nasty. And I thought the Vignali commercial four years ago was way over the line of the difference between comparative and negative, and I really disliked that commercial very intensely. But that doesn't mean it's not your job to say, my opponent is the wrong person to sit in this, in this position. He's the wrong person. I'm the right person. It's not just I'm good, but he's less good. And here's why. Um, but I do think he's going to run a lot of positive stuff about his record. I think he actually has a lot of things he can point to. Whether it's enough, I just don't know. Let me give Miguel an injunction. <clears throat> well, I just think, uh, number one, is that uh, going back to something that one of the panelists said earlier is that he just came off a primary campaign where four heavyweights were piling him pretty good on a negativity. 
you know, taking shots uh, both in the press and the commercials from, from Alacon and his commercials, from uh, uh, Hertzberg and from uh, Villa de Gosa. You know, they're all taking shots in parks, all taking the shots at the mayor. And, and, uh, and Antonio came off relatively unscathed in terms of neg negative commercials. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons he got only 25% of the vote was that you, know, you had all these heavyweights out there every, on a daily basis doing negative ads on him and pounding him and following up in press conferences and, and their political activity on negativity against this mayor. Now, his job is, is clear, is that he has to start doing the same thing to Villaragosa because Villaragosa was not hit hard. And for Han, you know, four years ago, negativity worked. As much as people did not, uh, people did not like that McNally commercial with a drug dealer, it worked for Mayor Hahn. So I think you, you're going to see him go back quickly on the negativity. He worked so, last year for George Bush. Yeah. I, look, I, I, I think it's going to be a negative campaign. And I think that, I mean, look at it this way. Let's just look at the history here. Jim Hahn went up with a positive commercial. Did everyone see that? His first commercial when he's walking really fast. He would have seen it because he probably put about 2,000 gross rating points of television behind it. That's a ton of television money. Okay, where did he go in the polls? Anyone know? He went down. LA Times poll showed him at 21 before the ad, showed him at 20 after the ad. So his positive did nothing to lift him up. So what did he choose to do? He reeled other people back down to him. He decided it would be Hertzberg. So when you are in a situation where there's nothing that you can say about yourself. He said he hired Chief Bratton in his ad. He said he brought down crime. He said he held the city together. He said he, you know, all these incredible things with newspaper clippings to try to validate those, those claims. Didn't move him. So uh, in my personal view, uh, when you look at Antonio Villaragosa's favorable to unfavorable rating, uh, it's way too high a ratio to go into a war against that guy. No way. With 70% favorable and 20-some percent unfavorable, can't win against a guy with those kind of numbers. Impossible. Okay, when you have to drive that guy's negatives up. <coughs> no doubt about it in my personal view. Now, who does it and how it gets done is another question. Because, um, I mean, look, we were in a situation, and, and it's analogous, because uh, it, Bill Carrick was doing Gil Garcetti, an incumbent district attorney who was also not perceived to be that favorable at the time, but he didn't have numbers nearly as bad as Jim's right now. I was doing Steve Cooley, uh, his campaign, and we knew, given the fact that Garcetti had run a very negative campaign uh, against John Lynch, who had run against him four years prior, right after OJ, when Gill was, at, numbers were so low, and they killed off John Lynch. I mean, they just killed him off. Uh, in anticipation of that, we did a television commercial, I'm giving you advice, A.V., on this one, uh, that basically said, no matter what, in that case, Gil Garcetti's negative ads say, remember who's saying them. The same, in that circumstance, Garcetti, who did X, who did Y, who did Z. And now he's falsely attacking Steve Cooley. Steve Cooley, who's been endorsed by the LA Times, who been endorsed by all these people. And we went back to it in the... To, to, to where we started, we said, so remember this time, if you believe Gil Garcetti, all you're going to get is four more years of him. So the same thing ad can be run against Jim Hahn, which is, he's, you know he's coming. You know he's attacking. What you have to do is kill the credibility of the ad. You have to remind them what you have today and why this person is saying those things. And so, and you're basically telling them, I know you don't like the way things are today, but if you believe that negative political ad, you're going to get that again. Um, and I think that was very effective for us back then because we clearly got 65, 64% of the vote. Um, I think Antonio has to move in that direction. I also want to say one quick thing. Um, watch where they go on issues. Your poll, every other poll showed education number one issue, right? Right. Okay. We knew that. We came out with breakup. It was important. It started to move voters. Antonio, that's going to be his, his, it should be his message. I mean, he should be out there talking about issues like um, his te support from teachers, his support for uh, education reform, the fact that this mayor hasn't done anything to, to deal with uh, education reform. Uh, and the mayor, on the other hand, is going to have to come out and talk about crime. 
He's going to make the whole issue about crime and his ability to come out and hire a new police chief. And, and uh, uh, you're going to see more statistics than you could possibly even imagine about how crime is down. We're all going to be the safest people in America by the time that's over. Um, but more than that, he's going to cut against crime on Antonio. He's going to make Antonio the softest, uh, weakest person on the issues of public safety you can possibly imagine. He's going to make people feel that you're basically unsafe if Antonio is the mayor. And that will be the interesting to, uh, uh, thing to watch these core constituencies and how they react to that. Do they believe it? Is there, do they have a sense that based on votes in the legislature or other things that, that, uh, that they're going to pull out, uh, that that claim is true? So I, I would watch very carefully for that in the negative campaign world. Yeah, let's get Miguel, then we'll get uh, Chris, and then Aram. Okay, just to uh, follow up on what uh, John Shaman uh, was discussing is that I also feel it's going to go negative in this way. I think because of uh, the mayor has to play and, and reel back in that coalition of the uh, white San Fernando voters and the black voters, you know, there's going to be, it, I think he's going to pose a question, can you trust Antonio Villaragosa? And you're going to hear that over and over again because that plays into people's minds in the back. Can you trust Antonio Villaragosa? And then he's going to take a page off of, uh, off of the Bush campaign against Kerry and say Antonio is a flip-flop artist. All right, and the big issue that, was, that the mayor will use to prove Antonio's flip-flop artistry is this whole half-cent sales tax uh, uh, in the county uh, for more police officers. So he's going to accuse <coughs> Villaragosa of supporting the, uh, that countywide sales tax where Antonio indeed spent a half a million dollars of his own money promoting that half cent sales tax. And then he's going to contrast that out with Antonio voting no on the city council floor to put a, a, a city tax increase on the ballot. So I think, and I think he's going to use that to say, can you flip flop and can you trust Antonio Villaragosa? Um, how much money are you going to spend, Miguel, over the next 10 Lots. weeks? Lots. Lots? <laughs> are you going to fund any negative campaigns? No, we, we probably won't do a negative campaign. Uh, you know, on, we asked Don't forget, them. we still, at the end of the day, Antonio Villaragosa still sits at the city council. <laughs> <laughs> Question number tw 23 in our survey said, should the sales tax be increased by one half cent to pay for expanded law enforcement in the city of L.A.? 41% yes, 52% no. So it seems to me that Antonio seems to be attuned to uh, how the people feel about that. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, I, I was really surprised coming into this the, the, the debate over the election as it got closer that Han was pushing so hard for a tax increase that it, it had just fallen short in November and there was no indication other than a poll that they had funded saying that, well, we're still about 64%, but that's 3% short of what they needed. And I, I, I can't remember a politician winning office pulling, calling for a tax increase. But it was trying to tie it to, obviously, public safety in his but record. It, it, but it, allows, it's a tax increase. it allows him to bring up Bratton again. Right, right. Chris. I'm just curious to know, are the LA Times, are they stepping outside their boundaries when they endorse a, a political figure? I think we saw similar things happening with the recent presidential well, elections. I, I think newspapers, let's I think. Let's ask Rick Orloff, because you guys endorsed, right? Yeah, we, we endorsed Bob Hertzberg in the race. Um, uh, newspaper publishers and uh, feel they have, you know, they, a free press is free to the person who owns one, and they own it, and so they decide if they like someone, they're going to endorse them. Uh, and what their argument is that we follow this stuff very close and this is who we think is, is important. Uh, I think most studies have found, though, that uh, in major races, like mayor, where people do kind of focus on who, who the candidates are, the, pe the people who do vote, governor, president, a newspaper's endorsement doesn't really change anyone's opinion. Where I think the Times endorsement matters is not in the mayor's race at all. You know, they endorse both Viragosa and Hertzberg, and I would be very surprised if they Presume that one endorsed the, the, one, the one that I would say, the Times endorsement, of, uh, the joint endorsement with Hertzberg, I think just help, helped Hertzberg's credibility. It right. put him at that, that neck, it put him up in the upper tier of the candidates. Where I think it really matters is in a smaller race, like in the 11th Council District, uh, where they endorsed Flora Gil Krisilov against Bill Rosendahl and had pretty a couple of really scathing comments about Bill Rosendahl. On the, on the races that people consider less visible, they will sometimes cut out the newspaper endorsements and really say that might be a guide. So the lower you go on the food chain, 
the more significant it is, and the Times doesn't even endorse in most presidential elections. Right. I, I, I thought the, um, as the recipient of, of the Times endorsement of the Daily News, Bob was, we, the Times is very astute. Um, I don't think they wanted to see a replay of the kind of nasty negative campaign that existed no one. Uh, I believe they perceived that, a, a, and really if you read the, the endorsement, it, they were arguing for a new conversation about the future of Los Angeles, which I thought was very compelling. It wasn't so much that you know th th they loved Bob or they loved Antonio. It was about, these are two guys who are talking about ideas. <coughs> and let's have a new conversation, because what we're going to get if we don't have, uh, if we have Han and Villaraigosa again, is we're going to get the same thing we had four years ago, which was a personal, nasty, negative campaign that at the end of the day is going to be decided based on uh, who connects uh, their negatives uh, more efficiently on television and not about compelling, provocative, uh, transformational ideas for the city of Los Angeles in the future. You know, when our, we didn't get to read the speech, but it was one of the best ones I wrote, which was uh, <laughs> going to be Bob's uh, election night victory speech. I only write one speech, so I said, you're on your own if the, the other thing goes. Um, and, and it was, we had this website ready to go. It's called BigIdeasForLA.com. And we were going to launch a website and hopefully a new discourse in Los Angeles with Antonio uh, that was to, to really contemplate what the city was going to look like in 20 years, what the city was going to do uh, to get us to a grand vision of the city and, and create a new conversation. That's what we were looking and hoping to do. Uh, I'm, I'm saddened by the fact, not just that my candidate <coughs> lost, but that we're, we're, the things we're discussing today is, is Who's going to attack? How are they going to attack? What are the constituencies they're trying to cobble together um, through negative, principally, advertising? And that's sad. That's really sad uh, because um, I was looking forward to, and I think many voters were looking forward to, taking it to a different level because when you saw turnout so low, so incredibly low, it goes to show that people have such low expectations of leadership in this city. They do not think that that matters. They fundamentally don't believe that the leadership can make a difference in their lives. And that if there's not something sad about that, I don't know what is. Because if you feel like going to the polls and not voting, which is your democratic right to do, then you've essentially lost all faith in leadership and governance. And uh, the hope is that there could be a, a campaign, it won't be this one, but somewhere in the future where people are inspired again about public service and that people can have conversations in the grand old days of Lincoln Douglas where they can vigorously debate issues but they, they have tried to avoid the kind of nasty, negative, personal politics of, self, of destruction that uh, has been the norm in, in most recent political campaigns. Thanks for that, John. Now we're going to have someone who's running for student body president. Good thing you talk right now, otherwise his whole campaign was going to be a tax. <laughs> go negative. Yeah. Go negative. <laughs> Around, they're telling you to go negative. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, actually, first, Mr. Shalman, I think you should release that website regardless. I think it's beneficial to students like us <coughs> to get that, uh, that aspect of LA politics. Um, but my question specifically, it's a two part. Uh, what's the likelihood? of new issues being brought in, such as immigration, and even with Flora Gil Kristalov, with airport expansion for this area, which seems to be affecting a lot of people. And secondly, what's the role of the families of the candidates that are running, do you think? Because in a presidential level, you have the, the women <coughs> strongly going on and getting the, the women's vote within the states. What do you think that'll be for the families of the uh, <coughs> people running in the runoff election? Well, that's three questions. Um, Miguel, we'll have you, well, since uh, Miguel Contreras is also an airport commissioner, and so we'll have him deal with that. Uh, who wants to deal with the role of, of the spouses in, in a camp? Hi, Harvey, how do you manage that? Because you've had camp. Well, you know, it, it, we have a kid, you know, in this case, Jimmy doesn't have, a, he's separated from his wife, but he has a de facto spouse in his sister Janice. <laughs> well, he uh, well, we had Jan Janice was one of our guest speakers you know, about two, three, so they were very well aware of her. Who is, uh, you know, you've all met Janice. She is a powerhouse. I mean, many people throughout the political career, I, I, I've known the Hans since, you know, 25, 30 years, have always said Janice is the one who ought to be holding political office long before, you know, she arrived <coughs> a number of years ago. I, I stopped her one time. Uh, but yeah, uh, you ran a campaign against succeeded. her. I ran a campaign against her. She, she remembers she, that. She, yes, she remembers it. We, did it. we all did it. <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks ago in Santa Barbara, and she likes to bring up a few 
piece of mail that I did uh, very accurately. Um, <laughs> but, but, but Jim has a de facto spouse, his sister Janice. She is a great campaigner. She's a protector of the Han name, even more than Jim is. And, and I think she's a great job. Uh, uh, Antonio's wife is one of the nicest, best people in the world who I think if she never <laughs> sees another voter. <laughs> Uh, and McGill, you can say that she is not a political animal. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that she was in the TV spots, she is extremely supportive of Antonio. It's a terrific family unit. But I, I don't think, I mean, she's got a full time job. She's teaching. By the way, you saw, as John talked about education, you saw the last Antonio positive ads. It's his best ad. Were his best ads, talking about education, talking about the future, talking about what, what he will do. Um, but I don't think you're going to see her out campaign. Yeah, I, I thought his best ad, um, well, personally, I'd hope the negative ad would run more than that one, but the best ad was having Karina Villaragosa in the classroom, showing herself as a school teacher, while he, his voiceover was talking about the importance of education and his wife in education, and then he went straight to camera after that uh, image of his wife and, and talked about education. I think you'll see more of that because uh, it connected people in a very human way to him and his family. We had a question right over here in the middle. Is that Joaquin? I can't see with the lights. Yeah, uh, Mr. Engelger, the first thing he said was that he was disappointed in the election turnout. And then Mr. Shaman had touched on the issue of, about the, the loss of confidence that's in the voters. Uh, so how can these uh, candidates and other you know, political figures regain the confidence of, of the voters? Let's start with the professor. Um, you know what was the highest turnout election in the 20th century in Los Angeles? You all made him buy my book, right? Yes. And by the way, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know I really admire you people. Uh, <laughs> especially when them royalties come in. Um, the highest they're, all, they're all selling it back right after the semester. <laughs> I'll give you a two-part answer. First, I'll answer the question. The highest turnout in the history of the 20th century of Los Angeles was the most racist, vicious campaign of the 20th century, 1969, when Sam Yorty demonized Tom Bradley every single day, and the turnout was 76%. Four years later, when Tom Bradley won, the turnout was lower, 64%. So the first thing I want to get across is that combat in politics is not incompatible with participation. In the presidential election, I must have spent 24 hours a day thinking about that election, mostly angry, most of the time. I would have voted if I had to stay up all night to get there to vote. In other words, it's not, you don't necessarily vote because we have a high-minded discussion of, you know, moderated by nice people about what the good things are we should do. Campaigns just are, are not designed to build confidence. What builds confidence is what the elected officials do once they're in office. Yeah. And we don't pay nearly enough attention. The same person you can't stand in the campaign. If they do a good job in office in the first three months, you completely forget what they did in the campaign. It is just part, it's ancient history. And, and, and I'm sorry, Rick. Uh, the <coughs> negative campaigns have been going on forever. Oh. Uh, I, you know, imagine before there was television, in fact, before there was, uh, I think there, the old story about the <coughs> campaigns back in the early part of this, of America where they actually would claim for a presidential that the can other candidate had died. And there's no way, you have to get someone on horseback to ride to that other state to tell them, no, he didn't, he didn't dead either. Picture. So, so it's been going on forever. What I was yeah, didn't, didn't you didn't you once run a campaign from someone who had died? Did. Someone had died that I had run a campaign. <laughs> and John Ashcroft <laughs> lost to someone who had died. That's right. But That's it was abundantly moment. clear. His funeral was at the Hollywood Bowl, and it was impossible to hide that he had, in fact, died. The I covered that funeral. The great. sheriff Sherman Block. Okay, so those of you. Are Let me also point right. out that our, all of our turnout figures are misleading. Okay, we have had, you know, in the, in, in, before, what do you mean by that? before 1974, we had what was called a negative purge in California, which means if you did not vote in a gubernatorial or a presidential election, your name was taken off their voter file and you had to re-register. Well, Democrats, myself included, because I was a legislative staffer at the time, changed the law so that we now had a, we, we, we no longer had a negative purge. 
What that means is I can tell you, I can tell you that in the city of Los Angeles, approximately 20 percent, if not more, but at least 20 percent of the voter file are people who are not alive, people who no longer live in the city, or people who are registered at more than one address because they, they moved and they really haven't been taken off the second address. Sounds like Chicago now. So it's, 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 it's very similar to that. Um, uh, we ran, I ran a campaign in the city of El Segundo just south of here a couple of years ago, a referendum campaign, and, and we had, you know, 3,000 people turned out to vote, and there's only 10,000 people who live in the city, and we were able to mail to everyone, and we, we and we, and, and El Segundo is a very stable, does anybody here live in El Segundo? Okay, we got the, so we, Couple of people, you know, El Segundo is an extremely stable community. I mean, there. Were, I remember uh, Mike Gordon, uh, the former mayor, telling me what you know. One week, it was a big week. There were six houses for sale. You usually never get beyond five. Um, and we mailed to everyone first class. Our first piece of mail, the return receipt requested, fifteen percent or re re registered re reply. Fifteen percent of the mail came back in El Segundo in a very stable city. Okay, because those people no longer live there were dead, whatever the reason, but they were on the, vo the, the voter rolls. So all of our turnout figures are misleading, and I really wish that maybe every 10 years or every 20 years we change, we do a negative purge, because you know something, it is discouraging to all of us to hear these turnout figures. I look at them and I go, yeah, they're bad, but they're not as bad. So even though there was a 28% voter turnout, to be real honest with you, that was probably a 36 or 37% voter turnout. <laughs> of real live people. 90,000, 90, I mean, look, I mean, it's, okay, maybe it's not as bad, but just look at it at raw numbers. This is a city of 3.9 million people. And, la and last night, two nights ago, I haven't slept, so it doesn't matter. Um, I believe those 90,000 votes earned you a spot in a runoff to become mayor of a four million person city. Yeah, wow. I mean, can you believe that? That is unconscionable. And again, I come back to this fact that, you know, if they don't perceive that leadership can ever do anything that matters for you, voters aren't going to come out. I mean, it's just a fundamental gut feeling that voters are so cynical today. I mean, here we had secession. We had a secession vote where the San Fernando Valley for decades have been saying, we want to be our own city. We want to be our own city. And whether or not they, some people believed in the valley or didn't believe it, we still had turnout that you would expect to be, you would have expected 70, 80, 90 percent of voters. This is whether or not you're going to be a whole new city, a whole new name, a whole new uh, uh, gov governing system. And turnout still was abysmally low. So, uh, you know, there's going to be some, some need, it seems to me, for people like you, young people and, and, and others to, to try to re-inspire uh, our, our government, our leadership, in a way that gets people back to participating in this process, because it's, it's incredibly Ray, low. go ahead. Let me suggest there's an even bigger problem in Los Angeles. Not everywhere, but in Los Angeles. In a democracy, when there's a big gap between those who live in a city and those who are eligible to participate in the governance of the city, at a certain point, it becomes a crisis that you don't even notice. Um, I think the figures are, is at least 800,000 adults that are not citizens in the city of Los Angeles. I think that, would that number yes, accord with what? Yeah. That's way more people than the electorate of many cities. But, but the reason I say immigration is the un, an underlying issue, because in daily life in Los Angeles, these people are part of the daily life of Los Angeles, and therefore they have aspirations. And their aspirations collide or ally with the aspirations of other people. That's normal. That's life in the world. What's striking is that they are not citizens and therefore not eligible to even be considered as turnout, mobilization, or any other figure you do. And I think the question I would like to see down the road is what can be done over time to draw more people into the literally the eligible electorate, which would make turnout go down, by the way, as a percentage it would look worse while it's getting better. Because if more people can vote, the number, the percentage will look lower, but the numbers will go up. And certainly Prop 187 revolutionized the participation of immigrant communities. Um, Viragosa's campaign certainly has had effect, and the union movement has had a big effect. All those three things, and yet, the distance to go, which you all would have seen the city as you walked around the city, 
I keep calling it the difference between the city as lived and the city as governed. You just don't want that to be too far apart. Um, it really raises some questions. Yeah. Uh, let's go with uh, Dr. Hunter. I wanted to follow up on the theme of immigration and um, particularly have you address the fact that Villaraigosa is Latino. On the one hand, I see that as potentially working for him in a city that's 50% Latino. On the other hand, I see it as potentially working against him as a city that's uh, fearful of the Latino future. And I wonder if you could respond to um, how the saying of the he'll be our first um, Latino mayor in modern LA history, is that gonna help him or hurt him? Miguel. You know, we went to that question four years ago with Antonio. That's the answer to that question. And uh, clearly, it's a sword that cuts both ways. You know, to energize a Latino base, it helps them, right, to be a Latino standard bearer. And the fact that I, there's history in the making. It's been 100 plus years since there's been a Latino mayor in the city of Los Angeles. So the idea of, of, of ethnic pride comes into play here. But that cuts across the uh, fears that certain constituents have in Los Angeles, particularly in the African-American community, or that Valley Vote that is currently up for grabs, up for grabs. So Antonio has to figure out, Antonio does not tell anybody that he's Latino. He is Latino, right? Not to convince anybody about it. So it, he, he should not run as a Latino candidate, you know, and, and it's just for, to uh, let it to other people. He should be a candidate who happens to be Latino, but I think that there should be, uh, I think it'd be wise for other entities to work within the Latino community that's not under his control to uh, bring out a high Latino vote. And I, I think what you're gonna be seeing also from, from Viragosa is he prides himself on bringing people together. Uh, last week he was at a Filipino American, uh, Filipino Senior Citizen Center, and he was talking in Tagalog to them. Uh, when he goes on the west side, he's, he speaks a little bit of Yiddish. When he goes to the valley, he's a dude. Um, and so he, he's, you're going to see him trying to, 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 a couple of things he's trying, one is the quality and tone of leadership he brings, that he brings people together, and that he, um, uh, that in a, a sense of making history in the city. I, I, I think there's an ideological issue as well. Um, a lot of minority candidates who have a more moderate position on issues are often even as palatable or more palatable to the white community than a white candidate. Uh, Rocky Delgadillo, for example, Latino, who ran for city attorney, a law enforcement job, uh, came off as a very centrist, very ideologically center to right uh, candidate, Latino. I don't think white voters, well, I mean, there obviously are, this be reality, but um, I don't think a white Valley voters saw that as a threat. Um, you've seen that in other races where moderate or centrist minority candidates uh, do quite well with white communities. I think Antonio's issue will be not so much that he's Latino, but that he will be defined and perceived as very, very left, very progressive, on, especially on issues that I suspect Jim will push on, which might be on public safety issues and other things like that. Uh, that's what I would be looking at. Yeah, but John, I mean, I, I agree with you, but there's, all, I mean, the, the ad that we all talk about four years ago, the drug ad, there is a, an attempt to say, hey, he's liberal on crime because he's Latino. He's more likely to be uh, liberal on crime and soft on crime because he's Latino. And then you try to begin to associate those Remember things. Show you? Uh, and don't you think, I mean, subtly that the can Han campaign is going to remind certain constituencies that he's Latino? Uh, you know, I, I, I hope not. I really hope not. But uh, well, what it, do you think? His, not what you hope. What do you think? Uh, I, look, I, I, I think that he, he has to be very careful in this election. Um, it will be, they will be ready for it. It will be perceived as, um, as exactly what it is. Um, it, it's very possible. Uh, you know, to the extent that they're able to push this issue on crime, which they did in that ad, which was saying so many things, but fundamentally what they wanted to communicate is you can't trust this guy on the issue of public safety, which is the top paramount responsibility of, of local government. Um, and if they read into it, some of those other things, so be it. Rafe? 
Yeah, I completely, I mean, you took everything I was going to say about that. Exactly. I just wanted to add a little bit to it. But, but the mixture of race and ideology is really the stew. That's the same story of Tom Bradley. Bernard Parks is quite conservative compared to Tom Bradley. Bernard Parks did not set off the kind of reaction among conservative voters that a young Tom Bradley did in the 1960s. Because Tom Bradley, his strength was his weakness. His strength was that because he was progressive, the energy level behind his campaign was like nothing you've ever seen. But if you just take the progressive part out of it, it becomes, you know, Parks' campaign, which gets some energy, but it doesn't have any sort of progressive energy. And I think, I think a lot of the things don't work against a Rocky Delgadillo that would work against Antonio, but at the same time, a Delgadillo candidacy would not nearly unleash the kind of energy that a Viragosa campaign was. So really, you know, we, we simplify things when we say it's race. We simplify things when we say it's all ideology and race doesn't matter. It, what happens is, the, especially with a, a candidate for the first time of a group, that's when you really see the race and ideology come together. Yeah, but race does matter. Look at our poll results. Only 5% only of whites voted for Parks. Even though you cross-tab that, many of the whites are Republican. Parks was the most conservative candidate by far. But not for the reasons you're thinking. I, I, I think, uh, going back to John's point <clears throat> about Bob's campaign, I think with Parks it had much more to do with his political situation. Who else was running and the ambivalent reviews of his period as chief. Let me just redo history, okay? Parks is an incredibly successful police chief. Everybody thinks he's just fantastic, but he steps down at the height of his chiefhood to run for mayor. Uh, there's not a Hertzberg in the Valley running against him. I think he does exceptionally well in the Valley. He pulls very well there, but, but he's had political stuff that makes that impossible. Yeah. We don't want race to count. The top a race does count. I mean, I'm the, not saying the top it doesn't votes, count. The top vote-getters amongst white was white. The top vote-getter amongst black was black. The top vote-getter amongst Latino was a Latino. Race matters in L.A. politics. Right? And, for, and, and therefore, uh, campaign consultants, like the two bookends we have here, mm -hmm. are going to factor that in. They're going to factor that in. Not these two bookends won't. <laughs> well, only because you don't have candidates in the race right now. <laughs> But just ask yourself this, could you run a camp campaign ad against Bernard Parks that says he's soft on crime? No. Because you need the ideological dimension to really make it come together into something okay, that really Parks was rare. He was a few, you know, most black candidates aren't police chiefs. You know, he's, he's a rare, rare example, so. But this gets to the other question. Go ahead, Mia. It does work the other way, though. I mean, I could see, I mean, I'd be cynical about it. I could see someone. I don't see the, any of you guys being cynical. I, I could just see the, uh, the scenario where in the Villaragosa camp, uh, they start thinking if they're fortunate enough to get Parks endorsement, uh -huh. knowing how critical the, 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 uh, <coughs> the vote is in the African American community, to run ads about a black police chief being gone and then have beatings yeah. uh, and the death of the youth uh, by the LAPD. You know, and that's a very subtle reminder. That's right. On, on based on race. That won't come out in the. I guarantee you that won't come out in the commercial. He was all, he, he was also a union member, Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Miguel, just one more question about this whole thing about race. We have about you know five, six, maybe even ten Latino elected officials who have endorsed Han. And so how does an elected, uh, Latino elected official, uh, like a certain state senator or a certain council member or, or what have you, when the, the Latino vote and then in their district, it was so overwhelming for Antonio, how, how does that work? And it's somewhat of the same question that I was asking you earlier about union membership going for Antonio. And how, how do you reconcile that? Well, you know, the Latino leadership in Los Angeles was split all over the, the place in this election. You no, know, but the Latino we had, community we had wasn't. Two, we had, we had uh, uh, Gil Cedillo, Senator Gil Cedillo, and I believe Ed Reyes in the Han camp. In the Villaraigosa camp, you had Speaker Fabian Nunez, and you had, uh, who else did you have with him? I don't know. Uh, who? Gloria Romero. Uh, Gloria, Senator Gloria Romero. And you had, uh, and then you had two of them that stood out. The two, that the, the two council members stayed out of this race. Uh, Alex Padilla, council president, and Tony Cardenas stayed out of the race. And uh, and so you had others 
in, in between, and now it's down to two. You know, uh, Ed Reyes, Councilman Reyes told me his, the, a comment about his dilemma. The dilemma is that Antonio won 80% of his, of his district number one in his district. You know, and, uh, uh, but he was within. So he what did you tell him? <laughs> I thought, well, this is, I said, you can't concentrate on your election, because it was his election, and he was up for election. Well, no, but he's won re-election now. No, he's won re-election so now. now. now what, should, what should he do in the run-up? Well, there's, there's a danger, too. A politician does only be perceived as, as giving their endorsement one minute and then flip-flopping yeah. and giving it to someone else. It does. He puts finger in the wind. And, yeah. again, it it's the, depends on the level of the endorsement and what is asked of you as an endorsee to do for the candidate. Yeah, I think you have to, you have to judge them by what they've done. I mean, I think on the Vieira Gosa side, you saw Speaker Nunez and Senator Romero on the campaign stunt with him. Absolutely. You know, I don't know. I, and I, I think on the other side, I think it was only Gil Cedillo that you saw with, with, Han. with the Han operation. Yeah. You know, and so depends. I think uh, Rick's right in terms of what their commitment is for, to that endorsement. But I just want to bring up one thing uh, is that I think this, uh, this is, a, uh, you know, this round two that we're having. You know, I mean, clearly uh, uh, the Antonio forces want to see what happened in the Yordi Bradley. Right, fight. And in the second go around, Bradley won the election. But I would think the other people who are watching Los Angeles really clear are the New York City politicians. Because, you know, after what happened four years ago in LA and New York City, you know, uh, Councilman Ferrer lost to Bloomberg, right? And I saw a poll <coughs> just a few weeks ago that had the uh, Ferrer up by 14 points over Bloomberg. Wow. So mm. it, it is, the, uh, it is a very interesting development that comes yep. here if, the, if a Latino candidate could win here in LA on the second go around and the possibility of New York repeating that I think uh, for the Latino vote nationwide mm -hmm. it's quite significant you know nationwide I've talked mean, I've talked to like 20 people who have shared these numbers with who don't know the context of LA but just look at the numbers and all 20 of them said there's absolutely no way that uh, Jim Hahn can win this race when they look at the numbers they say unconceivable we cannot even how that would happen would be incredible. How can that happen, Rafe? How can Jim Hahn win? Um, let's look at Gray Davis for a minute. Gray oh, Davis. Who, had, who's that? I know. <laughs> Gray Davis had worse numbers than Jim Hahn. He had numbers that I think no one's ever seen before. Well, he got recalled. You know? Well, but if Arnold Schwarzenegger had not been the replacement candidate, I am not entirely sure he would have actually been recalled. And if Gray Davis, if one can imagine a scenario where Gray Davis could have survived the recall, um, and they will tell you frankly that once Arnold entered the race, they, they, they believed they had no chance at that point. There was no way, at that point, there was no way they could find a way back. As strong as Antonio is, he has not yet been receive the treatment that is going to happen during the campaign. As you remember with Arnold, everything bounces off him. You know, he does things that, well, I don't want to, we're on cable not, here. Not but anymore. Not anymore, correct. That's right. Um, the fact of the matter is, people make phenomenal turnarounds in shorter periods of time than six weeks. But I will say that, that other than Gray Davis, I mean, this is, this is some, a mayor with seriously bad numbers. But I think John had, what you do is you always bring their opposition closer to your numbers mm -hmm. and then it gets in range and then if it gets in range other things happen people begin to say hmm you know he's making a comeback people start projecting this illusory momentum whatever it is front and front before you know it what's it front runners start getting defensive yeah it's got it's already started. and for those of you students out here it's called regression to the mean <coughs> which is if you're about as low as you can get and your opponent is about as high as they can get, pretty soon they will start coming closer to each other and that will create a sense of something happening. I mean, I'm not saying I think it's likely to happen, but I'm saying that's how it would happen. And it's not I know we're still set many weeks away. Who's going to win right now, given what we know right now? You want to violate the Yogi Berra rule? Yes. Yogi Berra said you should never make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> um, uh, the reason I won't say anything is I, I made a prediction no, about the you're, presidential you're election to my class of 220 students, and I did it down to the percentage point and the key states. Let's just say I predicted a little wrong and had to come in on Wednesday morning and face, of course, I'm not going to have to face you guys again. Um, you're a I tenured bet, professor, come on. 
Oh, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> I, I guess rationally I have to bet on, on Viragosa and leave open the possibility that Han can pull it off. Hey, Rick, who's going to win? I'm not going to say I, I have no idea. Uh, election night, my editors came over to me and they say, who's going to come in one, two, and three in this race? And I said, you know, I don't know. And they said, what the hell do we pay you for? <laughs> and, I, and I said, yeah, yeah the, the, the race was, it was, a, it was, it's been a fascinating race. We had five articulate candidates and despite all the stuff you're hearing about the negativities, it was, a, it was a very interesting election and I'm looking for an interesting runoff and, and I couldn't tell you today who's going to win. John, who's going to win? Uh, I have to lean right now to Antonio. I think that it's going to be a much closer campaign than people expect. I, um, it's, I believe it's Antonio's to win or lose right now, but uh, they both have outstanding consulting teams. I've worked against them and with them, and, and they can pull off uh, some great, you know, surprises. So I certainly uh, uh, think Antonio will probably end up the victor, but I would not be surprised if Han is able to pull it out. Harvey? Gotta go with John. I mean, I won't bet my house. I bet Rafe's. But I think I, I agree with John as well. I think we're looking at numbers that are going to be 53-47, 54-46. It's you know, I, I talked to two chief deputies of city council members today. Both of them extremely articulate. Both of them very politically savvy. Only one of them, my relative. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, uh, and one of them laid out for me very articulately how Jimmy was going to pull it off, and the other one laid out very articulately how Antonio was going to pull it off, and, you know, as we've done tonight. Uh, but I think, I think uh, Antonio is going to, you know, sort of like Godfather 2 is a better movie than Godfather. I think this sequel's got a different ending. Talking about Godfather, I see, oh, Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> what a lead in, what a lead in. <laughs> Who's going to win? Well, I think it goes back to what uh, uh, when the panel said earlier about it. It depends on who comes out to vote, you know, on election day and who has the best machinery to get out to vote on election day. I think given the uh, uh, Tuesday's result, everybody in the room has to understand that Vera Gosa is the front runner at this point. You know, there's not qu no question about who's the front runner at this point. But again, we're still eight weeks, over eight weeks away from this election, and a lot of circumstances can happen. There's allegations uh, in the DA's office or U.S. Attorney come about. Is there a disaster in L.A.? Because, you know, believe it or not, disasters are good for the incumbent. You know, and you saw that during the rainstorms. And who did you see? You saw Mayor Hahn during the rainstorms for those, those few days that it, that it started coming down. You see, uh, well, look what happened Giuliani in 01. He was, yeah. he was term limited out, and he almost was able to win. So it's yeah, like, I'm saying is that so there's the circumstances of eight weeks that we don't we don't foresee. So yeah. uh, I think Vito goes a front runner, but you gotta I gotta uh, uh, just just give you the uh, the flag is that uh, this mayor has never lost a citywide election, and and this has been a wake up call for Jim Hahn, and I saw him the last few days as feisty as combative as I've ever seen them. Wake so up, I think it's been a way. throw them off the roof. I mean, yeah, well, you know, whatever it did, I think it worked. So yeah, yeah. I think hey, it was a very good two, two more questions, Sherry, and then right here. Good evening. My name is Sherry Prabrahim. I had a question for the political consultants. How many different ways is there to run a campaign? It looks like surprises could pop out of nowhere. But to me, it seems like, you know, kind of common formula to get someone elected. These are the things you have to do. Yeah, so how, how, how are they going to be surprised? I mean, you guys have done everything, well, it's, you know, it's, including the it, kitchen sink. It's sort of like my, my, it, 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 it's sort of my philosophy that you build a strong foundation when you build a house. When you, when you build a house, you build a foundation. Every house's foundation looks pretty much the same. But what you build on that foundation can be extraordinarily different, okay? And everything, you, you know, it's your imagination and your resources are the only things that stop you from doing anything you want to do in a political campaign. And virtually every election, someone comes up with something new, someone comes up with something exciting, someone comes up with something memorable. John did it in this election with, with the, you know, which, you know, I will vote at the AA, American Association of Political Consultants as the best TV commercials of the year, bar none. And also, not just the best artistically, but also the best in selling their product. Okay, you know, quite often, when I was in the advertising business, I'd see people do beautiful commercials, but the product would go out of business because no one bought it. Um, John did a great job in both those things. They were great and people bought it. Um, but how you build, how, what you put in the campaign, well, to be honest with you, that's why, why, why John's a multimillionaire and, and, and that's why, you know, people, 
you know, I get a trailer house, and uh, you know, people hire us for our imaginations. <laughs> His trailer house is in Palm Springs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, miss, uh, Mr. Multimillionaire. Yeah, hardly. Um, look, I. I think that today to win a campaign that you're not expected to win, you really have to be transformational. You really have to throw out the rules. And I, we saw that a little bit with Howard Dean, where they tried to do a campaign through the internet. But at the end of the day, while his campaign was transformational, his candidacy wasn't. There wasn't anything he was really saying that he would do as president that was extraordinary. There's no major tax reforms or major health care system reforms. It, his campaign was transformational, so he didn't connect it. Uh, I think that a campaign that, that wants to uh, be successful, that has an outside chat, shot of doing it, you have to really throw out the rules and try to push the envelope. We tried to do that a little bit in this campaign. I, as I said before, when Antonio got in, it, it, it really narrowed our, our capabilities. But in this campaign, um, it, it appears that Jim is the, uh, is the sort of long shot candidate, and that's a very strange place to be as an incumbent. Um, I think that he has to really uh, uh, throw out the rule book and go back in and rethink how he does this. Uh, coming out with a traditional campaign, I, I believe it will not be a recipe for success. I think they have to get together and really think about how they're going to recapture people and their imagination and, um, and, and get them motivated to vote affirmatively yes for him. Because at the end of the day, his positive ad that he was running was not getting more yeses. So if they go to the straight negative campaign, which I would expect them to do, uh, I don't know that that gets him over the 50% mark. I think that he's got to come up with something really innovative to get people back into his camp. Yeah, one more question, Dr. Marks. As we try to get our students to come out again and do this great experiment on May 17th, what can um, the campaign advisors, the pundits, the academics tell us about how you guys actually use exit polls? From a reporter standpoint, we, we, we like them just to give us a feel for what is going on that, that day with, with voters. Um, uh, part of the problem is because the last few major elections, exit polls have not been reliable because people lie to the pollsters. And so it, it, as you keep doing this and your, uh, your exit poll results reflect what the real results are, they become more usable over time. Miguel. We do our own internal polls, you know, and then we look at the exit polls a lot for uh, targeting on what areas to target and, and the message on particular groups. So the information that gathered here is, you know, where, where is the uh, chance for change and who turned out to vote again targeting where? Because LA is such a big city and you, you might run a different measures in San Pedro than you do in Encino, a different measures in the west side than you do in the east side. You know, and so the targeting and then the, and the messaging is what we use it for. Yeah. Rick? For me, it's a, a very important part of my research um, and, and articles I've published using the Times exit poll, and I'm going to talk to you guys about how to steal some of your stuff for publication. Because if you get enough people and ask enough questions, you find out far, far more than a traditional poll, a traditional telephone survey. And the other thing is you can look at subgroups. Uh, if you get enough talking to enough people from groups who don't get represented in the regular surveys that are done again and again in campaigns, such as Jewish voters, Asian American voters, uh, subgroups of Latino voters, you can help scholars a tremendous amount to figure out the differences among groups. So many polls will tell you, I've seen polls that said, well, blacks are voting Republican. And then you looked in on the little fine print and there are four African Americans they talked to three of whom work in the White House, you know. And, <laughs> whereas if you do exit polls, you're, you're getting hundreds of members of each group. And if you get 500 members of each group, as an exit poll like the Times can get with Jewish voters, you can then look at Jews in the Valley and Jews on the West Side. So it may be hard work and it may be discouraging, but I believe what you're doing, what you guys are putting together, is going to get used by scholars for years. And maybe you'll all get your names in it. We can put all your names in my next published article. Um, just sign book, in it'll over be here. And it'll be in your book. It'll be, it'll be a <laughs> sign-up yeah, sheet right, right here. I, 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 I would just say, just to add to that, um, we're, most of us in the business are very data-driven. I mean, we have to 
uh, create a campaign plan targeting voters and messaging to voters. And, and to be successful in the city of Los Angeles that is as big and diverse as it is, you have to use every bit of data that's out there. We spent a lot of time going through, literally from Mayor Reardon's first campaign forward to this campaign, going through exit polling data to watch for trends and to watch how groups are thinking and to get a perception of, of what's the new trend, where are people today, and how do we devise a message and target that message to those voter groups. So your exit poll and the Times exit poll is incredibly important in terms of uh, crafting messages and targeting those messages, micro-targeting messages. It's not just to Jews, but Jews in this council district who are older than 55 and might be a woman or something. So being able to take all of those different uh, uh, things to nuance your messages. Yeah, we didn't have important. a we didn't have a co category of might be a woman. It was either woman or guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting. Yeah. You need to break it down. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to redo the survey. Hey, this is two two centuries of political experience collectively here. Uh, the insiders of LA politics. So this is awesome. Thank you very much for coming, guys.